Hey everybody, what's going on? I am Greg Sussman, joined today by Jim Sadas of FanDuel, who's here to finalize our Week 10 DFS lineups with the stacks that you need to know about. What's going on here, Jim? I'm all good, Greg. I think the theme for today is trying to find low salaried ways to get exposure to the week's best games. Because personally, I've got a lot of issues with the value running backs on this slate. Like, they're fine, but most of them have some concern, whether it be their floor or their ceiling. So I kind of want to try to spend it at running back. But to do so, I've got to find value elsewhere. And I think the three receivers we're discussing in the stacks for today can help us do that. So that's kind of my theme for today. It's low salaried ways to get exposure to the games we like a lot this week. It's really interesting that's how you put it, because I was wondering, after receiving the email of the players that you're going to stack today, like, where was Russell Wilson and Tyler Lockett, right? Like, this was, like, the obvious combination to me with Jalen Ramsey, theoretically, on DK Metcalf, and it wasn't here. This is the first week, in all seriousness, the first week in the last nine weeks where yeah. you have not taken Russell Wilson and either DK Metcalf or Tyler Lockett. Is it all just a monetary thing here? Well, I'm still going to use them. Just uh, <laughs> didn't, didn't crack the top three from a stacking perspective. So to be to be totally clear, I'm going to use Ross Wilson, and I'm going to feel really good about it. Uh, just didn't quite t crack the top three. And I think that you can go Lo Metcalf or Lockett. Matchups don't matter. I think they're in a great spot. So I love them. I just happen to love these three receivers a little bit more for their salary savings. We'll get back into the Seahawks-Rams game in a little bit, but we begin with your favorite stack here of the week, and that's with Kyler Murray and Christian Kirk. Kirk has turned it around, really, in the last few games. He has found the end zone. They've taken deep shots with Christian Kirk, and his role has really solidified over the last few games that you have to feel a lot more comfortable using him in DFS than you had been earlier in the year. Absolutely. And I think that's the key thing there is the deep shots because we know he's going to get the high leverage looks. You look at the games since Christian Kirk came back, he actually has more downfield targets than DeAndre Hopkins. Hopkins target share at that time is down to 25%. So it's taken a bite out of DeAndre Hopkins and Christian Kirk has come through on that volume. So what incentive do they have to change things? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it's not broke right now. Kirk, 20% of the overall targets since he came back and 26% of the deep targets, but also he is getting a lot of work near the end zone. And that's big because what that gives you is multiple routes to success. Christian Kirk can pay off with yardage. He has 75 or more yards. If three of his past four games, that's great but he's also getting a lot of red zone work. And that means that even if he doesn't get the yardage, he can still at least bail you out with a touchdown. I love wide receivers who can bail me out for dumb decisions. Christian Kirk can do exactly that. I think that's a key thing here. He has a floor. He has upside. I think that's really intriguing in my favorite game of the slate. So Christian Kirk, I think, just a rock star option here at $6,300. As far as the quarterback goes, Kyler Murray, the number one quarterback on the slate without question for me. He's averaging 68 rushing yards per game this year. That is equivalent to one and a half passing touchdowns from a fantasy perspective. He's just too good. I mean, Josh Allen's easily number two, but Kyler Murray's easily number one. This game is amazing. I think that Christian Kirk gives you access to it at not a, not a super high salary. And yeah, Kyler's second in salary, but... Who cares? When you get that many points, it doesn't matter. So I think these two, a pretty easy stacking pair for Sunday. Cliff Kingsbury has unleashed Kyler Murray at this point in the year, and they've also unleashed Christian Kirk. You're right. Some of it's coming at the expense of DeAndre Hopkins, which a lot of fantasy analysts kind of foresaw before the season began. And after the first couple of weeks, we all took the L. We were wrong. DeAndre Hopkins is still DeAndre Hopkins. And now that they did the last Christian Kirk here a little bit, it's kind of changed into the dynamic that we thought. Kyler Murray has certainly become the fantasy stud that we knew he could be. Christian Kirk getting those deep shots, it makes us a perfect combination for what should be a high-scoring affair against the Buffalo Bills. And speaking of those Buffalo Bills, Josh Allen went off last week, and it was exactly what we were hoping for against the Seattle Seahawks. The question is, can he do it again? You're begging on the answer being yes. And you're pairing him once again here with John Brown. And I asked you last week, why go with Brown over Stephon Diggs? And a lot of that was salary related. So I'll throw you the same question again. Why John Brown over Stephon Diggs in this Josh Allen bill stack? It is salary related yeah, because like straight up, it's Stephon Diggs. Stephon Diggs is amazing. Stephon Diggs is going to have a great game on Sunday. I want to make sure I get as much Stephon Diggs as I can as a result of that. But again, if I want to get those high salary running backs, I've got to find value somewhere. And John Brown gets me that because he is just $5,600, which is like 
absurd how low that is, given how good of a role he had last week. I know, obviously, we can't overreact to one week, but if you look at the games where John Brown has been healthy, so not just last week, but if you exclude weeks three and six where he was clearly not at full health and then get rid of the games that he missed, he has a 20% target share this year. He has 23% of the deep targets and 23% in the red zone. Stephon Diggs has like a 42% deep target share that time. So like, again, Stephon Diggs is really freaking good and my favorite high salary receiver this week, but... John Brown is also my favorite low-salaried wide receiver, so why not just go at all these guys and have one in most of our lineups? Uh, Brown, he's not quite as high uh, as a guy like Christian Kirk for me, but I think that overall, John Brown has a good workload, really low salary, has both a floor and upside. And also, Greg, do not forget, it is a revenge game for John Brown against the Arizona Cardinals. I don't know why we give other analysis. That's all that truly matters to me, at least. Uh, so that all bodes well for John Brown. As far as Josh Allen goes, like I said, he is the number two quarterback for me on the slate behind Kyler Murray. So just stack up this game. And if you want to use uh, Murray or Allen with the uh, high salary running backs, you can do so. You just got to use guys like Christian Kirk and John Brown. And those are two guys I am very, very willing to use this weekend. Revenge game narrative in effect for John Brown. We talked about the revenge game yesterday with Duke Johnson facing his old team in the Cleveland Browns here this week. So there's a cheap running back for you. But John Brown in a good spot. And like you said, there's a lot to like there. It's the high floor and the reachable ceiling uh, with Josh Allen playing the way that he is, getting the ball to John Brown when he's been healthy. He has been effective. So is Stephon Diggs. His Bills offense Facing these softer defenses has obviously proven very, very worthwhile in DFS, so we expect to take advantage of what should be a high-scoring affair between the Cardinals and the Bills. We started today's program talking about Seattle Los Angeles contest. And yeah, you're going to use Russell Wilson and Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf in your DFS lineups, but they didn't crack your top three stacks. Jared Goff and Josh Reynolds did. And I think Josh Reynolds is the more interesting name, right? We've taken quarterbacks against Seattle all season long. And with the Rams, their wide receiving core is Robert Woods, Cooper Cup, and then Josh Reynolds, maybe. But Reynolds is obviously the chief exposure here. And again, I have to imagine that's what goes into it. But how do you trust, I guess, Josh Reynolds in an offense where he's just never going to be the focal point? It is a bit of a leap of faith, Greg, because if you look at Josh Reynolds' game logs this year, he has not had more than 60 receiving yards the entire year. And the checklist at wide receiver is you need to get either 85 yards receiving or two touchdowns. And Josh Reynolds hasn't shown that yet. So, like, it is a leap of faith to use him, but this is the best scenario he has had. And I say scenario intentionally because it's not just the matchup. The matchup is obvious, but it's also a back-and-forth game that could feature a lot of points. And that's key because the Rams so far this year, their defense— and again, their defense, I'm saying this intentionally, has faced only one top 10 offense the entire season. In that game against the Bills, they let up 35 points. It was a game that featured 67 total points. So there haven't been a lot of games that the Rams have been forced to throw in the second half. This will be that game. They're not going to dust away Russell Wilson right away, which means we're going to see more pass attempts out of Jared Goff, which is beneficial for Josh Reynolds. So if we take away the first two weeks for Van Jefferson at more of a role, Reynolds has 16% of the overall targets and 29% of the deep targets. He actually had four deep targets in week seven alone. So... We can expect more pass attempts to the Rams here. We can expect Josh Reynolds to get a decent number of those downfield. And I think the efficiency on those deep balls should be pretty good, given what Jared Goff can do against defenses that don't generate a lot of pressure. So Reynolds is $5,000, and I'm willing to take that risk. Yes, like I said, it is a big faith. But it's worthwhile, given the, the the building blocks he has within his repertoire so far, that show he can have one of those ceiling games. As far as Jared Goff goes, I don't like to use running backs who don't run. But if I'm going to use a, run, a quarterback who does not run, I need them to be able to go nuts as a passer. Jared Goff last year against Seattle, 395 yards passing. And again, like I said, this is going to be a back-and-forth affair. That can lead to a quarterback doing a lot with just his arm. So Jared Goff needs to get like 395 yards and four touchdowns, but... I think in this matchup, that actually is possible. So Jared Goff and Josh Reynolds, $7,400, $5,000 respectively. They're going to give you a lot of flexibility to get those fun running backs. And I think that that is worth it this week, as long as you think this game will shoot out. I thought the stat there about the Rams just not facing a top offense is, is very glaring. And we know what Seattle can do. We 
see them coming off a loss, and they put up a ton of points in that loss to Buffalo, and we expect the offense to continue to cook here this week against the Rams. Uh, I, I think Jalen Ramsey's going to have a tough time covering DK Metcalf or Tyler Lockett, which means Jared Goff and Sean McVay are going to have to put together a pretty darn good game plan to take it to Seattle, and it, we expect that game plan to use all of their weapons, Robert Woods, Cooper Cup, Gerald Everett, Tyler Higby, and yes, Josh Reynolds. Price at just $5,000. It doesn't take much. Yes, you want to get those 85 yards receiving. You want to get a couple of touchdowns. We talked about Christian Kirk and the deep shots being there for him. We expect more of the same for Josh Reynolds this week. It only takes one deep shot, and hopefully we get it in a game that the Rams are going to have to score a ton of points to keep up with the high-flying Seahawks. That's going to do it for us here on the FanDuel. Hurry up. Our Week 10 coverage is in the books. I'm ready, Jim. I'm excited for this weekend. Thanks so much. Yeah, we got the Masters, we got college football, we got the NFL. It's a great week to be a, a sports fan, so I'm excited to see how things play out and then wrap things up with you on Monday. It's a really, really fun weekend of sports, kind of out of nowhere in the middle of November, but that's what 2020 will do to you. For Jim Sonis, I'm Greg Sussman. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you back here on Monday for another edition of the FanDuel Hurry Up.